for alums to get together. I saw this one. And I was just asking a lot of questions. And Tammy said, you know what? You might be a great person to introduce Sean. And I do think in the, the true spirit of, of Willis and Northampton School, um, authenticity uh, rings loud and true. And like, she, like Tammy said, I've been following um, Sean's Instagram account for years. Um, he's captured wonderful photos at Flyers games, um, downtown marches on Philadelphia. Um, that's what else? Eagles, uh, when the Eagles won the Super Bowl against the Patriots, capturing some of the mayhem downtown and even just glorious uh, fall days as well. So a real fan. And then he also does some great sunsets um, on the Jersey Shore. Um, and I think in addition to just having a great eye, like a lot of photographers, they have an interest in history. And uh, one time I was visiting with him and he took me through the Reading Terminal, not just the uh, eatery, but uh, more the historic tour as well. So I think there's that passion for history and, and you'll see in uh, the photos that he shows tonight um, that, uh, you know, he's, he spent a lot of time behind a camera and uh, he's pretty passionate about what he does. But enough about me. Um, I'm going to read you a quick overview of Sean, and then um, we'll talk about the, the question um, period as we go along. Sean has been in the information technology industry for more than 25 years. He is currently the senior enterprise administrator with the IT department at Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, also known as SEPTA, uh, for over 17 years. Prior to SEPTA, he worked in the IT department for Amtrak and Canon USA. Before IT, he worked as a photojournalist with such esteemed organizations and newspapers as the Associated Press, the Boston Herald, and SIPA Press Agency. His photographs have been published uh, in the Boston Globe, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Philadelphia Daily News, the New York Times, and Newsweek. He continues his photography, having his photographs from Jersey Shore published in the Brigantine Times. His expertise in IT, combined with his photographic artistry, provide for his ability to produce published photographs from his point and shoot camera and even his cell phone camera. Sean, after Williston uh, in 1979, Sean moved on to Boston University where he graduated in 1983 with a BS degree in photojournalism and from Drexel University with an MS in information systems. So he's gonna have a nice uh, slide deck of photos of the presidential candidates he's come across uh, and the actual presidents. And so if you have questions about the photographs as we're going along, um, feel free to put them in chat. Uh, I'll pass them along to Sean. If you have a question about other aspects of photography, um, we'll save those to the end when there's more of a Q&A. But as the slides come up, we'll handle those questions as they come. Does that sound good? Sounds good. All right, Sean. Stage is yours. Share. There we go. Um, thank you, Dave, for that introduction. Thanks to uh, Tammy and Jill for putting this all together. Thanks for everyone out there to join us. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna give a big shout out to uh, Bob Couch, who taught me a lot of photography when I was at Williston. Uh, I was there for two years and uh, graduated in 79. So I'm going to start and show you some photographs and tell you a few stories about photojournalism. And if you got questions, chat them in. Dave will tell them me. I can't see the chat, but Dave can shout out any questions. So um, before we get to the presidents, we're going to show some photos from Williston. This is snow in 79, which looks like it's gonna happen in the next day or two for most of the Northeast. Um, I got my first, you know, did a lot of my early photography there and spent many, many, many evenings in the dark room in the science center in the uh, lower floor, which is cool. Um, here is some action photos of uh, getting tossed into the pond and it's kind of cool. The black and white photographs were the only thing back then for the most part to be taken. Uh, no motor drives, no auto autofocus, had to process all the film. It was very fun and very cool. This is the, some of my classmates would know all these photos, the famous shaving cream fights, which we used to have as a seniors. 
And uh, it was basically flash photography, pre-focus, and uh, basically pray and hope that it was sharp. Um, here is the famous group photo of the guys in Ford Hall. Um, I only probably made two or three frames of this. Luckily, most of the uh, faces were there and it was sharp. I made a whole bunch of prints for everyone. But this, you know, taught me the importance of um, hopefully taking multiple frames and hopefully one of them shows up. So when I went to Boston and went to Boston University, I started working on the school college newspaper, which then was a daily newspaper printing five days a week, which was pretty cool for back then. And actually we made money from advertising, actually a lot of money because there was no internet back then. So every beer, beer company and anyone in the city who wanted to reach college kids wanted to be public, you know, run one of their ads in the newspaper. So I was a young freshman and I got a chance to see Ronald Reagan, which this was the day after he announced he was running for president. I kind of went down to the hall where he was speaking. I basically kind of snuck in. They really did not check press credentials that closely or even really done, did much security. In the lower right hand corner is the photograph which ran on the school, front page of the school newspaper. It's the standard kind of headshot, which is kind of not very interesting. But the better picture was on a, like a third or fourth roll of film, which I actually never processed that day because I only made three or four frames of him greeting people in the crowd because these were made with a flash and I held the camera above my head, pre-focused the lens and just got a couple of frames. They call these in the business a Hail Mary because when you put the camera above your head, you're supposed to say a Hail Mary and hope, hopefully the shot comes out. Um, since I only made five frames on this roll of film, I did not process it the same day I took it. I processed it a couple of days later and then realized, oh, wow, this was the best frame of the day. It did get published later on, which is kind of cool. Um, so during my years at Boston University, I started working for the uh, Associated Press at times. In the upper right hand corner here is George Bush campaigning up outside of Boston in the same February 90, 1980. Um, a kind of cute story of this is I went up with a reporter from this college newspaper. I did my pictures. We lost track of each other. Then I lost my ride back into the city. And I was kind of like not sure how I was going to get back. Uh, went up to the press bus. The press, press bus was not that filled. The media on there, the national media were all kind enough. Kind enough. They looked at a college student and said, come on on and we'll get you back to the city. I got back to the city during the ride down. They were all typing on their manual typewriters and drinking what else? Bush beer. Um, the other two photos I made of uh, Bush up in Perkins Cove, Maine, um, back in 2007, these were obviously digital color. Uh, initially, I was there to have lunch. All of a sudden, President Bush shows up in his high-speed boat. Um, I really didn't have the right camera with me, so he was eating lunch. I went back to my room, grabbed the big camera, and took a few pictures of him leaving. He was very, very nice to people, waved to people. You know, he was pretty ground, you know, pretty grounded to say the least. Um, this is Carter. Carter, when I was, this is again in 1980. This is when I was a freshman still at, well, actually it's 1980. So I was probably a sophomore at college. Um, it was interesting that Back then, they had a national press pass for the campaign, and we got them as a college student newspaper. 
And when we showed up to cover Carter, they led us right up front to our surprise. So we got some, I got some great pictures of him, um, all black and white, um, no flash, manual focus, but it worked out pretty good. Then as I freelance for the Associated Press, this is the 1984 campaign. Um, and you can see it's Gary Hart and John Glenn. This shows you the technology to transmit photographs back up to the 1990s. And you would use this basically glorified um, fax machine. And basically you would make a print, black and white print, throw it onto a drum, which is in the lower left-hand corner, then it would take eight minutes to transmit the photograph. And you would hope that the phone line would stay up and running and you wouldn't have any glitches. And yes, you see those clips, those alligator clips to basically clip the uh, transmitter into the phone line. Yes, there are many times I would do that. And part of the problem was getting a clean phone line. I can remember when the Patriots were in the Super Bowl. So this was probably in the 1980s sometime and they were away and I was working for the Boston Herald, we would keep a phone line open for like five hours. So we made sure we had a clean phone line to transmit the photos. Um, so as you can see up above, um, the captions were written on, I, were put on a, written on a typewriter and then they were taped to the photograph. This was pretty much standard for about easily 50, 60 years to get photographs transmitted to newspapers across the country and the world. And if you wanted to send a color photograph, you would need to send it three times for the three different colors. And it was called a color project and it would take easily 30 minutes to send. So, Things have changed drastically since then. Also, the cameras have changed. This is the type of camera I would use back then, this heavy Canon F1 with this big motor drive. And it would only go probably three, three and a half frames and make a lot of noise. And you would carry a whole series of lenses. Zoom lenses were really not that sharp. Uh, you would carry a whole series of still lenses and you would carry multiple cameras. Um, flashes were like big at one point, they got a little smaller to this size, but still it was a lot to carry around. Um, so here in 1992 is President, well then Governor Bill Clinton, in Philadelphia, I had the opportunity to photograph him. This was for Seeper Press. By this time, I was shooting a lot more color film. A lot of times back then in the early 90s, we were shooting color slide film because the quality was better than color negative at that point. Um, but it had a downside. You had to get the film processed. I can remember many times you would ship the film basically unprocessed to New York, it would get processed, then edited. I would never see the results or know what turned out correctly, you know, or what looked good. And that was not uncommon. Even when I was shooting black and white for the Associated Press, a lot of times you would ship the film, someone else would process the film and make prints. So you would never really see the results until hopefully it gets published somewhere. Um, it was uh, a different time. It was, it took a lot more teamwork. Um, when I was working for the Associated Press, a lot of times I made extra money working in the dark room or being a runner to run film at sporting events, which was a nice way to extra money. And when I was living and working in Boston, I would go to the, uh, Boston uh, Fenway Park and be an extra photographer for the Associated Press. And one of the nice things about it was I would get basically a free dinner 
which was really nice. And then if one of my photographs got used on the wire or got sent away, sent out, I would get some extra money, which was really a nice way. Nowadays, that doesn't help ha happen that much because with digital, you can shoot so many more photographs and don't need anyone in the dark room. Um, let's see. Here is the Republican National Convention in Philly, and this was in 2000. I had the opportunity to take pictures for CEPA Press, the French agency. Um, at this point, I was working in information technology. So during the day, I would do my day job and then I would go down to the convention and we would shoot color negative film at that point of the politicians or whatever was going on that night. And then we would, the event would end typically around 10, 1030. We would gather all the film up get to a local lab, which we paid to keep open late, a professional uh, processing lab, get the film processed at like 10, 30, 11 at night, take like an hour to get processed. Then we would scan the images and send them out uh, via a modem up to a central location where they get stored and then people could uh, use them. But, Ron, I have a quick question from uh, one of the viewers. When were dark rooms no longer used? Right around now, about in the 2000. Um, by this time, most newspapers were switching over to complete digital. The magazines were doing kind of like what I call a hybrid, meaning they would shoot color negative and then scan the images in. This is the time when this changeover was happening. Uh, and I can show you, these were all color negatives and then scanned in using like a Nikon scanner and the file size were probably a couple megs and then they were transmitted to a central location and then they, people could pick up the images from them. As a matter of fact, in this last set of photos, the upper left-hand corner, you can notice that the photographers, some of them have, have digital cameras because you can see them chimping or looking at the back of the cameras to take a look at the LCD screens. So it was a mixture by that point. Um, and, and I was using a combination of some of my cameras had autofocus and some were still manual focused, like this big old manual focus, depending on what size lens. Were the, were the dark rooms missed um, in terms of, you know, maybe the purist using it or yeah. was it just uh, people like to expedite the process? Yeah, it, it's all about speed and how fast you could get the image out. On the other hand, yes, people did miss the dark room. One of the things I did miss was when I was working at the newspaper or like the Boston Herald in Boston, we had a big gang dark room where we had probably what, seven, eight enlargers. And then in the center, we would have a set of sinks where you could process your prints. And we would all critique each other's work and help edit each other's images to get the best image onto the paper. And that all disappeared when you basically went digital because everything gets shot and then it gets sent to someone to edit. And that usually a person who edits it really edit, edits alone or the photographer edits their own work, which is not necessarily always the best. You, you don't always get the best shot. It's sometimes really helpful to have someone else to edit your images, crop them and take a look at them and say, hey, this is a better image and you don't even realize it. So that's a good question. So that's 2000. So this is 2004 and this is uh, John Kerry making an appearance in Philadelphia. By this time, everyone was shooting digital, 100%. Um, I had switched completely to digital um, no one was really shooting film at all. The digital camera quality had risen to almost 
as good, if not that better than film. And you know, speed of the cameras, everything was so much better. The dynamic range was almost the same as film. You couldn't even come close to it. Uh, um, Sean, how about um, with respect to the effects or textures um, that darkroom development allows? Uh, is there other, or other, is there something lost with digital photography? Yeah, I mean, you can dodge and burn as it, it, it's in some ways easier when you make prints in a dark room to dodge and burn. You can certainly do it in Photoshop or Lightroom. It takes, it's a little different and you can do a lot, but it is different. It feels different for sure. Um, I feel when I shoot digital, I shoot almost like I'm shooting slide film where I want the quality of the light to be really good. Uh, I tend to basically underexpose maybe a third of the stop to, uh, and then I feel that I can bring back the details in the shadow easier using Lightroom or Photoshop. Mm -hmm. would, be, would anyone using film today? And if they were, what would they use it for? Perhaps maybe not in this situation you're explaining, but. No, you wouldn't use necessary film in pure photojournalism, but certainly it probably has its place if you're doing something which is more artistic or landscapes and you want that type of feel, the granularity feel, it certainly has its place and it can be a lot of fun. So this is in 2008. Um, I, I photographed Hillary Clinton on a number of times. She always seems to end up in Philly. Uh, Pennsylvania has always been a key uh, state in the uh, primary campaign. You can notice here in the lower left, all the reporters now have laptops. They're, you know, filing their stories almost right away and instantly. Uh, it's the beginning of where social media is playing a very important role in the coverage. Uh, here is Hillary Clinton just after she was nominated. It was the day after where she made an appearance at Temple University. Uh, a big crowd was there. Uh, this is all um, a combination of long lens and wide angle. By this time, I was shooting a lot of the wide angle stuff with a high end point and shoot like this Canon. Sony makes a very good comparable camera too. And for wide angle, not wide shots or anything which is not telephoto, these cameras do a great job. The smartphones were getting pretty close, very good quality by this time. Um, but here's a couple more images. The one on the right is with uh, a pretty long telephoto, is probably a 200 millimeter. And I waited to the very end when she was working the crowd until she got really into the crowd and it was kind of a nice image. Um, and then here is Clinton again when she came back in November 2016 with you know, Obama. And she made an appearance at uh, Independence Hall, another huge crowd. Um, I remember I basically kind of snuck up on the into the press stand, big uh, lot of press there. It was uh, it was a kind of cool night to say the least. Uh, the boss showed up. All the these both were taken with like a seventy to two hundred. 2.8 and you know it's somewhat cropped to get the because uh, it was pretty long throw um, and now here's the biden joe biden in 2019 this happens to be literally a 10 minute walk for me i live in center city philadelphia this is on the benjamin franklin parkway uh, it literally showed up at the last minute and said you know what i should go up and check out what Joe Biden is doing. Um, the lower left-hand photo was kind of interesting. After he spoke, I was like pleasantly surprised. He spent easily 45 minutes working through the crowd. And I just got very close, close to him in the crowd, used my high-end point and shoot camera, 
flipped it above my head and put the LCD screen down to do what they I would call a Hail Mary. But in this case, I at least could see through the LCD screen and line it up to get him doing a selfie with some of his supporters. And it, you know, and in some ways, I think it's maybe the best shot out of everything I shot there. Um, getting these published nowadays is a lot more difficult because nowadays everyone sends their images so quickly to their prospective agencies or wire services that if you don't have your images out the door within like an hour or two after taking them, their value just drops very quickly, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I'm going to end this with uh, a whole bunch of some tips about what I think is better use of your smartphones or good use of the smartphones. I think smartphones can take some great pictures. Um, I, the quality is just amazing. These pictures were all taken with an iPhone 10R, which is not even the latest iPhone, but it just shows you the quality. Um, one of my kind of pet peeves is when in doubt, get closer. I want to thank my uh, wife, Shelly, who's in these pictures for posing for me. Um, closer is better. These were all taken last weekend in Brigantine, New Jersey on the beach. Um, be aware of your lighting. If the sun is really in front of you, you, you can not be the greatest quality. On the left, the sun is directly in front of me and it kind of like grays out and makes the whole scene a little murky. On the right, I turn around, the sun's behind me. It's a lot more contrasty and the quality is a little better. Um, but I still think the new phones do a pretty good job. Um, use the tap to set the focus and exposure. I think that's really helpful. Don't hesitate to tap where the face is or where you want the exposure or where you want the, you know, the subject, the center of the subject to be. I think it's really important. Um, the portrait mode, it's, it's cool. It's really a nice feature. I don't hesitate to use it. I would use it, uh, I, I use it a lot. I think it's great. Uh, as you can see here, um, I put it in portrait mode. It takes the, blurs the background. I think it's a really good feature and it works really well. Turn on the grid. So unbeknownst to a lot of people, most of all these phones had this grid grid capability. I think it's really useful for landscape photography. Turn it on. I would just leave it on. This way you can line up the uh, sky and keep things straight. I think it's a really nice feature and I just leave it on all the time. Um, it's something I think it's really useful. Adjust your exposure, play around with the exposure, take a lot of frames, unlike the days where you had uh, film was not only expensive, you only had 36 exposures and then you had to change the film, which presented challenges when you were shooting film that you had to be careful how much you would shoot because you don't want to run out of film. Well, nowadays with digital, you pretty much, it's pretty, it's difficult to run out of disk space. So adjust the exposure up and down on the left-hand side, the lower left is what would come naturally, the camera would try to do, which is trying just to do a gray scale and just keep it neutral. On the right, I changed the exposure, made it a little underexposed and look, the sky gets redder, it gets in a little deeper, more contrasty, it looks nicer, it looks more like what you would see when you were there. And yes, this was just taken on Saturday evening at the Jersey Shore, so. Sean, Sean quick, quick question while you're talking a little bit about uh, social media and Instagram in particular, um, any tips for inside uh, shots or still life and food? Um, you know, um, not necessarily people, but, you know, as lighting can be tricky indoors, um, any tips on that? 
definitely keep the lighting behind you, behind the camera. Uh, that's for sure. Hold the camera steady. A lot of, especially the smartphones, I think inside tend to go to a lower shutter speed, which means you can get motion. So it's key to, you know, take a breath in when you do a shutter, uh, snap a shutter speed, snap the shutter on the phone and try to uh, move the object, whatever you're photographing and put the light behind you. That's really important. So there's a couple, there's a couple of tips I have. Um, and so those are some of my tips and tricks. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I still take photographs. Uh, I do, I'll, I do a lot of my photographs down at the Jersey Shore where we have a place, get them published in the weekly newspaper down there, which is kind of fun. In the city here of Philadelphia, I'll take pictures of what other events or whatever is going on in the city here, uh, especially you know, recently with uh, all the interest in the campaign here, there's been a lot of activity here, the national campaign. So, I appreciate everyone listening. You can have a good laugh. You can see I did have hair at some point <laughs> when I had these uh, credentials. Not anymore. Um, feel free to follow me on Instagram or Twitter, uh, Sean Carden, and uh, I'm open to any questions, thoughts. Thanks so much, Sean. There was one question, people wondering, uh, where was Donald Trump? <laughs> Donald Trump has not been in Philadelphia much, so I've never photographed him. He's only been here and sent in the in the Pennsylvania or Philadelphia area just a few times, mainly just to raise money. Right, right. Well, I do have a couple of good questions. Um, you had you talked about obviously um, a lot in the dark room. Have you taken some of your films? So those um, shots you took back in the in the seventies at Wilson. Have you digitized those? Um, and uh, did you, have you kept that in, in another form or do you still have all your negatives in a slide sheet? So yeah, what you saw there was digitized. It, I, those are probably scanned either from prints or negatives. And I still, I have a bookshelf filled of negatives from we'll list them from the seventies all the way up to the eighties of all the black and white negatives which at some future point I should go through and scan them or at least edit and scan the best ones. Right. Do you have any tips on, um, you know, digitizing? Mm. So I have color. a Canon scanner, which scans 35 millimeter film and it does a reasonably good job, but I think that there are newer scanners out there to scan negatives or slides. Uh, I think important is to edit your work down and just pick out the one, the best ones to scan in. Cause you could scan in, if you have a lot of negatives or slides, you could have a lot of images to go through. Right. I think editing so, Sean, could I ask you a question? Could you um, stop sharing your screen? Yeah. And then, um, if anybody has any questions, um, I'm gonna open up the chat room, but if you have a question, you can just type, I have a question and Dave will call on you and then we can um, have some dialogue between you and Sean. Um, and so I'm also going to open up the chat. So if anybody sees any friends and they wanna personally chat with people, feel free. Um, so again, if you want to start asking questions, um, and it might be nice if you want to see speaker view, put it on speaker view, um, then you can see who's asking the questions as well. All right. Am I on speaker view? Meredith in the weeds? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we see you, Meredith. <laughs> I know. How I'm the only one that does not have a background. <laughs> Maybe I should still be in the weeds. But there was a great picture of the shaving cream party. Right. And I would love to purchase that because it's Leslie Shereen in that who's in my class. And I bet she doesn't even remember the picture. 
Oh, probably not. You know what you should do? Um, send me a chat. What? So I would contact you directly to try and get a copy of that. Contact to purchase me. the photo. Yeah, purchase. I'll just make a print. Just send me an email or contact me directly. No, but those are such sweet days of the shaving cream days. Yes, it but was a lot of fun. I just want to say I enjoyed it so much. I actually have to do another Zoom call, which I hope I'm not in the weeds again. <laughs> um, but I, I really appreciate seeing everybody. I loved it. I love the presidents. I, you know, it just beautiful shots. Do a great job and continue on. But I'm gonna have to sign off now. Thank nice. you. There's a uh, in quite coming question from uh, Peter Corellis. Do you want to uh, unmute Peter? Hey Pete, thanks for. Oh, Peter. Hey, Sean, how are you? All Good right. You. Nice job. Nice work. Always has been. Um, I'm, in, I'm in this business also, not photojournalism or anything else. I design cameras. Um, Sean and I have talked about this in the past. Um, my question to you is, and I have a smile on my face asking this, do you think photojournalism is dead? And the reason I ask that is that, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, when we're all, all the photographers we used to anguish over every little detail, not just composition, but we would anguish over aperture, lighting. Um, we were all experts on lighting and side lighting and backlighting and everything. And every photo meant something. Maybe the price of film was the expensive part. Like we could only get 36 pictures in an, in an issue. You know, then we were dead. Then, we, then we have to run somewhere else. Nowadays, people will shoot 400 shots hoping to get one that's good. Right. And nobody cares anymore about making, you know, the cameras themselves will auto aperture. The cameras will auto focus. The cameras will do everything. You just tell them you press the button on the app and it just does the stuff that you used to use. That was your intellectual property. That was your imagination was, oh, I'm going to defocus the background. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And all those shots that you have now, which we look back and say, wow, spectacular it's a single button on, a, on an iPhone. So the question is, do you think photojournalism is dead as a profession or as a art form or as a, you know, and do you think it's just been replaced by, by just pure quantities and happenstance? Yeah, in some ways it has. It's very difficult to make a living as a photojournalist. My, so I, as a whole group of friends who I went to BU who, you know, started out as photojournalists, very few of them are still in the business feed. Very, very few of them. And the few which are still in the business count themselves lucky that they, they can make a living. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's very difficult, just what you said, you know, because all the, you know, advances in technology and then the social media, uh, the, like, so I still have friends in the business in the newspaper industry or in the uh, wire services, and they're just lucky to have jobs. I think one area that they, they keeps them going is sports, because doing good sports photography takes a lot more skill and uh, equipment than a lot of the other areas of photojournalism, that's for sure. Are there still photographers as a profession like this, or is everything per diem now? Like best shot wins, and you do, you know, you know, everything is now from the Boston Globe. You know, I get I get Im uh, emails all the time saying, "Can we buy that photo? Can we buy right. that photo? Can we buy that photo?" Um, you know, are there still really professional photographers out there anymore? Not as many, that's for sure. Much fewer, much fewer, because you're correct. You know, they nowadays they they will buy your photos and they won't pay you, you know? And a good example is uh, when the Pope was in town here and I stumbled upon this cute feature of a bunch of nuns uh, in a group, group, like looking over a kid and get this, Time Magazine picked it up and wanted to use it on their Instagram feed. And it was like, 
I'm, I, it's like impossible to get paid. And that's a great, great example, Pete. Yeah. You know, it's, if you're a staff photographer at one of the newspapers, you're just, you're lucky to have a job and you hope that they keep you on and there are not many of them around. I have another question from uh, Connie Wilson coming in. Connie, do you want to uh, unmute? Sorry, I was away from the mute button. Um, love the show tonight. Thank you for doing this. But just had a question just about framing. Uh, one of your thoughts on framing images. Do you subscribe to that sort of one third, two thirds um, of where the image might maybe need to be framed within the within the shot? Yeah, to a certain extent, yes. But rules are to be broken at times. So I I don't always abide by it. But that because naturally your eyes look at your eyes photographs or the all right good just curious thank you good question and love seeing couchy i know i don't have my camera on right now but i love seeing couchy here yeah. big shout out to him yeah. big influence <laughs> thank you for joining us uh, yeah. Yeah. richard brown has a great question i'll let him uh unmute as well Hi, uh, it's Richard speaking from the UK. Um, and also I've worked in the railways in England. Uh, so this is a railway question, really. Uh, my question is working for Amtrak and then for SEPTA, have you got some great pictures on trains moving? And I was thinking maybe particularly on the Horseshoe Curve, which is so well known across the world. Um, I've taken photographs on Amtrak and SEPTA, not that many. I've not been to the Horseshoe cr Curve, which is in the middle of the state. I know where it is, but I've not been there, you know? Um, but that's a place I want to get to. But you're I, up to uh, Well, I just, in, in here, the train rail fans, uh, train photography is a huge, huge thing and quite a business, actually. A lot of people right. uh, seem to manage to make some money out of it as well. <laughs> I think it's a bigger business, I think, there than here. Okay, thank you very much. Sean, what about um, photographing random strangers in this day and age of privacy and fear of having something put, again, on a social media site? Uh, again, let's say you capture kids having a great time in a puddle and there's parents standing around. Uh, are there do's and don'ts now if you really want to kind of capture uh, life as you see it in a park and, you know, um, versus the old days when people were maybe more trustful uh, or less distrustful, I guess. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier, Dave. Yeah, it's it's a big, a bigger concern now because I think people get very uh, rightfully nervous about people taking their pictures, especially if you're in a public park or an area and they want to know what you're going to do with it. I can remember back in the 80s or uh, even early 90s when I carried around a big camera, it, you know, people weren't used, you know, not weren't used to it. It was unusual and they would just automatically think you're working for some newspaper or some organization. Now they question you, you know, quite a bit. I mean, and legally, if you're on a public street or a sidewalk, you can take anyone's photograph because you're in a public location, but people read into it that they have their rights that they can prevent you from taking pictures, but really not. Do you have to get uh, photo releases to publish photos taken out in the public? No, but if you're going to want to get a lot of organizations if you can get take pictures of people's kids or they would really want to release you know but you don't really necessarily need that if they're in a public street or a sidewalk right what about those um protests and march marches you uh took photos at in philadelphia um and advice about you know documenting tense situations that are newsworthy i mean um you know harm's way almost also i mean your own yeah i i yeah i, I try to keep 
uh, like a low profile, get it, you know, and get in, get the photographs, whatever I want to get, and then get out. <laughs> um, because it can get very nervous. Uh, yeah, especially here in Philly with all the protests we had over the summer. Eh, there was some tense times. Um, but the one thing I learned is try to get your photograph, you know, take some pictures and keep moving. You know, don't stop too long. That's for sure. Um, John? Yes. Uh, I don't know whether I'm on or not. Okay. Yeah, you're not. Have you, uh, have you uh, been back to see the facilities we have at Williston now compared to what was under the entrance to the science building? <laughs> a lot better now than back then. You, you've been back here? Yeah, a few times, yes. Good. Because the, the program here now is amazing. Ed Hang has done a super job. Yeah, a lot better than that little dark room. In the, yeah. <laughs> With a mushroom growing out. Of the room. That, that, that was supposed to be a broom closet, but we we made it I, into a dark room. So I remember that. that. Mushroom was growing out of the wall. No, no, that's an oh. M door. Good. Great to see you. It was. It's great to see you. It was a great time at Williston. It was really. I learned a lot. Uh, it was is really really great place to be no question about it you know yep and it's I great agree. you i'm curious just a, a show of hands now that we kind of have uh the group shot how many people took photography either under ed hang or couchy <laughs> yeah i i just like couchy's dog <laughs> <laughs> I just like Couchy's dog. Yes. <laughs> it made, it, made Williston feel like home. So Is thank it you. Or Guinness? Yeah. Uh, the yellow lab. Oh, cheddar. Yeah. That was cheddar. Yeah. Yellow lab. Good dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Ed Higg. I know you're out there, but are there anything, because um, you obviously took photography from Couchy that you're doing with students today? I mean, obviously lesson plans and change and we've got, um, you know, cell phones and other things I know you've introduced to students, but are there any uh, things you remember that Couchy taught you that you bring to class today? Um, yeah, so the question about, um, you know, do people still use film? Um, <laughs> I keep, I've, I've kept film in the program um, because um, I feel that um, it makes um, for better photographers. I think that the kids now with this, I mean, when I first started um, teaching, uh, frighteningly 20, over 20 years ago now, um, you know, it was darkroom only. And I took over basically Couchy's, um, you know, black and white, develop film, make prints um, curriculum. But um, over the, you know, over, over the time I've been teaching the, the technology and the process has changed radically, but um, my feeling is that kids, uh, students, photographers, you know, with the phones and with the digital cameras and the automatic everything, um, it there's a lot of image making. I think Sean was saying, you know, hundreds of pictures can be made, you know, very quickly without having to worry about film or the right button or anything. You just sort of go bam, 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 and, and you take pictures, and you don't. The photographers don't think as much. And, um, and in particular kids with their phones, they're so used to, you know, just blasting their phones all over the place. And I think that um, for me, slowing them down, making them think about the picture, um, going through the process, not seeing that picture on the back of a camera or on a phone and wondering, did it come out? What does it look like? Why, you know, why uh, change a shutter? Why change an aperture? So I think that, um, you know, Couchy's teaching the dark room that, crazy closet in Scott Hall that I spent way too many hours in. Um, I think that has um, stayed with me in the program um, and will hopefully continue to do so. Um, there's also just the, the magic of, you know, when I teach darkroom, there's that moment that's still like, you put that print in the tray of developer and, and, it, and it just emerges from that white sheet in a chemical. 
it's still magic to me. I, I, and I think the kids think I'm a lunatic because they put the first print in that demonstration in the, in the developer. And I can't like not be giddy going, oh my God, look at this, it's so cool. So, you know, Couchy introduced that process to me and I still, I still have that magic moment every time I put a print in the, in the developer. And I think that's um, something uh, worth hanging on to. Certainly, you know, we use phones, we use um, every possible piece of technology um, <clears throat> available to make images now, but I still teach historical processes too. So um, it's also really hard to sort of keep track of all the technology changing. Um, and I wish in some ways that I didn't have to do the technological image making that I could just sort of stand in a dark room and move prints in a tray, but that's not happening these days. And how many students are signing up for photography year in, year out, would you say? Um, I probably over the course of uh, a year, you know, they're, they're now, um, I think there are eight levels of classes now uh, wow. because they also teach video. Um, but I would probably say that, you know, um, I probably reach maybe 80 kids a year um, in all the various levels. You know, some kids take uh, a course every trimester. And so, you know, there, 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 um, there are kids who take, have taken eight levels of, of uh, imaging. Um, some of them, you know, there are uh, lots of intro courses. So I'll have kids just come in for one, give it a try. Um, but class size average is about 10. Um, except when we get up to the super esoteric classes, then they sort of um, thin out a little bit, but quite a few kids come through the program. That's great. Peter, you had another question? Actually, a comment um, following up with um, I think stuff here. Um, film's not dead. People still shoot film. Um, mostly they're the purists, they're the same people that listen to albums, right? Because the albums have higher audio ranges and things like that. And film has higher dynamic range. And um, so I think you know, I think there are people that still shoot film because they do produce images that have richer whites and darker blacks and things like that because they can produce like dynamic range. Um, digital really hasn't, you, you can only display eight bits on your display, right? And so you're kind of limited on a digital image what you can display, where in film, when you actually pick up a print, like Mr. Mr. Eng was saying here, you have a print, I mean, you're getting, you know, 20 bits of whites to blacks and so on. So there's a lot of people who still do that. Um, but they're the same people that listen to albums, right? Because albums have, you know, higher audio quality than say CDs or certainly digital. Um, the other thing that was kind of making a comeback was like the instant print. The people used to love the idea of coming back and the Polaroids would pop out and within, you know, within 10 seconds, you'd actually have something tangible in your hand. Um, there was a while here a few years ago where Polaroids, especially in Asia and some of the places where, where people were loving them again. Um, and it was this hybrid where you had digital and Polaroid, you could upload it, but you had actually had a print in your hand and you could mark it up and do things like that. So I just, you know, um, I, I love the fact that people are still in dark rooms because you do understand what you're doing. People don't understand anymore, they don't. They just shoot, 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 shoot. And then they sort through them and say, I like that one. They don't even crop sometimes. So, you know, forcing people to go into a dark room means you have to understand the process. And, uh, but people just do show film. And Pete, there's something else. I think people to put too many photographs up on social media, just like dovetailing into saying everyone shoots too much. They put too much up, you know, they don't edit and just put the best couple of frames. They put like 10, 20, 30 frames up. <laughs> How many of those sunset photos, how do you typically take before you find one that you really like? I could take 20, 30, 40, 50, you know, and I will only put up one or two. I'm super picky. And that goes back to the days when I was working for the Associated Press a lot, you know, Associated Press or the Boston Herald, especially the Associated Press, where they would say wire time is so, you know, because they only, it took, eight minutes to put out a photograph. So you would want only to put out one or two photographs, which would tell the story. 
And that's all you could do. You didn't have the time on the wire to put out any more photos. So I think, you know, editing your photos and only putting up the best photo is really important. More is less. Yes. More, <laughs> More is less. Absolutely. May I make a comment? Yes. Can I be heard? Can I be heard? <laughs> yes, please, Donnie. We can hear you. Oh, okay, good. Just as a retired uh, uh, portrait photographer, my husband worked for Kodak and then was a uh, portrait photographer. Our big concern these days is that people are taking all these pictures, but they're not making prints that could be passed on to other generations. Everything's electronic. And uh, if, if anything happens to the electronics or they go out of date, then your pictures are no longer available. Yeah, that becomes an issue. Yeah, true. Yeah. John, have you tried HDR yet? Pardon? H HDR P. Uh, high dynamic range stuff. Have you tried doing it yet? Not much. No. I know, Pete, you've been playing around with it. I, I shoot things that happen real fast. That's my right. job. Right. Exactly. I, I'd like to, just haven't had the time. Yeah. How about the quality and longevity? of a, a picture. So let's say I go out and grab a, a great sunset like you did at Brigantine and I come home and I just send it right to my color printer at home uh, versus take it to, you know, the old shop down the street or send it out to uh, Mystic Photo, which probably no longer exists. In 10 years, will that thing fade because it just came from my color printer? How do you save those images long-term? Kind of uh, dovetailing a little bit on Dottie's question. I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I have plenty of inkjet because I have a couple, I've had a couple Epson inkjet printers and I've made prints and yeah, I have some which are hanging, which are easily 10, 12 years old and look really great. Still look just as yeah. good. Go ahead, Ed. So um, there are um, ways to guarantee your prints also, not guarantee, but to look into the longevity of your prints. Um, there are, um, particular printers, types of printers and papers that actually will outlast some of the old C print technology in fading. So um, there's a company, a testing bureau called Wilhelm Imaging, and they test inks and papers. And um, there are papers and inks now that for inkjet that will last in excess of 200 years um, without fading. So that is um, one place that I think you know, the digital technology may be um, putting the old print styles um, uh, to bed in, in longevity. The other thing about, um, I would caution people in terms of the, um, I think Dottie was saying, you know, things, do they last or, or how do you, you know, the electronic media. Um, there was an article in the Times, I think it was a couple of weeks ago about, you know, people uh, loading stuff up to the cloud to store things and, <clears throat> I am not a cloud person. I have many hard drives that I back up um, duplicates to because um, you know a hard drive can fail. But just be aware um, if you're loading things up to the cloud, uh, sometimes those cloud-based businesses will go out of they'll go out of business. Those cloud-based storage companies um, without much warning. So you may load your entire photo collection into the cloud and get it sort of this email that you're like, oh, what do they want from me? And you don't maybe open it like, hey, we're closing down our server in three months. Get your pictures off of here because in three months, they'll be gone. And you're like, you know, I, I very early on, I tried a cloud-based storage service and that happened to me. I didn't check the email and thought it was just some kind of, you know, selling me something. And three months later, a chunk of images were just gone. Um, you know, people say, well, you know, Google Drive or or um, some of those companies might probably not go away, um, but they may also start, a lot of times what they'll start doing is charging you more for access or um, say, you know, um, just, just be careful people on the cloud. Um, it's not the greatest storage um, universe um, 
you know, it's not foolproof. That would be one of my cautions to you. But in terms of print longevity, um, you can actually make things on an inkjet print. Um, just be aware that the ones that are home-based printers that are, there's two different inks. One is dye-based and one is pigment-based. And the photo printers that last a long time are called pigment-based printers. May I jump in for a sec? Absolutely. This is Nancy Jones, um, class of 82. So I missed a lot of you guys. Um, so one thing that has been hammered into my head is to save my, my files as TIFFs, to not start out as a JPEG, start out as a TIFF, um, and keep them in TIFFs until you have to send it somewhere and then switch it over to a JPEG because it starts to, the image starts to degrade. You know, it gets all like mosaic um, and pixely. So that's one thing I wanted to mention as a tip. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Also to, um, to Dottie's point, I think <clears throat> you missed the dining room table event of sitting down and passing a photograph around. That doesn't exist anymore with digitals. Yeah, you can bring the projector in, but nobody does that. Also, when you write, you know, to Sean's point of the picture with the AP and, and typing out what the picture was about, on regular pictures, you would sometimes turn them over and say, you know, 1946 Thanksgiving at Julie's house. But with a digital print, you're just sending the picture. You don't have the background so that a generation or two behind you will no longer know, well, who's this? Who's this? We, there's nothing there. There's no context to the picture. So I think we've lost some of that with, with digital where there's, I mean, there, there certainly are, are, are library type programs where you can link pictures to text and that. But I think the average person doesn't do that. So you, you lose the ability to share to share a picture when it's digital and not not a print. I've, I've got a question for Ed. Not yep. sure. Ed, are you still on? I am. Good. Um, we all know for moving picture, we all know to if our, our our senior in high school is interested in going to you know moving picture, you know make movies. They go to Emerson. They go to USC. They go to NYU or maybe a select Big Ten school. Uh, for for film, um, for taking pictures, where do you, uh, where are some colleges that you recommend or that you are aware of that are still um, pursuing this? Uh, so we're talking about for still photography or for video filmmaking, which one? Still? Still, yeah, still. Um, so there are many schools that are teaching, you know, still teaching still photography, um, you know, the classic art schools, I think that it depends on where you want to go. Um, you know, if you want to be a fine artist, that's going to be one kind of university program. If you want to be a commercial photographer, that's going to be another program. If you want to be a photojournalist, then, you know, as Sean said, that's a tough one. I mean, still photography is a tough um, universe to be in right now. Uh, but, you know, Syracuse um, is a great program for the sort of commercial um, universe um you know the classic art schools RISD um is a good one emerson for filmmaking uh nyu for um for the documentary photography um uh, nyu has a pretty strong program um the art center college of Di design in california for like hardcore commercial work um, so they're out there. The one thing that I would, uh, if you're, you say your son is, is interested in um, filmmaking or photography? Uh, daughter. Daughter, sorry. Um, I would caution them to not be, and I say this to all my students, um, you know, become more of a multimedia um, artist. You know, I, I'm starting to sort of call this more of a uh, rather than photography or filmmaking or video, um, I'm hearing the term lensed-based artist um, or lens-based creator um, as, to, as opposed to a photographer. Um, I would think that the photography programs, a lot of them, and you know, hearing from former students that are now actually working in the industry, um, a lot of them who studied photography, you know, in my early days, they are um, 
constantly telling me, tell your kids to definitely get some video in there. You know, I have um, a former student alumna. Um, she's a stringer for the New York Times. And um, she's constantly telling me, ah, they keep asking me to shoot video. Um, and I don't really like it. And I need to learn it. And what can you do? And is there any kid that's really great that you can hook me up with to help me be my assistant? And um, it's interesting because she, um, she actually, I, I was reading the paper the other day and there was a story on um, cheerleaders and um, I saw her photo credit and I kept scrolling down and there actually was video in there. So, you know, she is putting that to the test. She is a trained still photographer, um, but she, her clients ask her to shoot video. So that's one of the things that I would be, be aware of. Um, but again, it's all, there are multiple venues and possibilities for um, what schools go to. But um, I think that it's not entirely about, in the still photography world, it's really still not about the university that you go to. It's about your portfolio. Um, I do think that in the filmmaking world, that's a little bit different because that's much more of a collaborative universe and you're making your connections in that universe more so. Um, but if you have questions, um, just contact the alumni office and have them provide my email address and I will gladly um, Zoom with you or your daughter and um, we can talk it over. Thanks, Ed. That's a great, great offer. And how are we doing on time, Sean? I'm conscious we've run over a little bit because obviously we've got a great topic here and we've got people who are real enthusiasts. So um, I just want to check in with you. Yeah, we are fine. It's what, 840? See if anyone else has got any other questions or thoughts. Dave, you've been a great Ed. moderator. Oh, Ed's got another uh, question here. Uh, for Sean, um, where are you located? Philadelphia-ish, the Jersey yeah. Shore down there. And you yeah. said you've come up um, to see the facility several times. Yeah, I, yeah, I get back for a reunion. But I haven't seen you, so you need oh, to stop yeah. and say hi, and you know. Yeah, next you. time. Yeah, I, I, I do get back up there for reunion. I'm not sure if I'm going to be back up there before the next reunion. Not sure, but definitely I get there for reunion, and we'll have to meet up. Yeah, let's do that. You know, um, I'd love to walk you through and pick your brain and show you what's going on up there. Yeah but I've been back up there a few times. Yes. Yeah, I'm in Center City, Philadelphia. I've been here for about 30 years or so. And then at the Jersey Shore, just north of Atlantic City. Terrific. Pete, do you have another question or are you just waving? I actually had to leave. I want to say goodbye to Sean. Okay. So, and, and all my other classmates, Owen and Maggie and everybody. Yeah, else. it's so, great to see you, Pete. Thanks yeah, for your uh, thoughts. Super and job, so super job, Sean. It was really see you, Pete. So, hey, Owen. Hi, Maggie. Hi, guys. So, yeah. so. well, Owen, Maggie's there. Yeah. So, yeah. Elizabeth. So. All right. Well, I'll turn it back to Tammy, who uh, will wrap things up here, but. Sean, thanks so much. That was great to hear a little more insight and uh, look forward yeah. to connecting uh, when the pandemic is behind us. Yes, it was a lot of fun. Great to see everyone. I did have a quick question. Go ahead. Liz is there. Sean, I was wondering, what would you recommend? I've taken lots and lots of photos and videos over the years. What do you think is the best way to store all of it? Um, I kind of... I, I think store it in multiple locations. Yes, you could put it on the <laughs> external hard drive and put it up in a cloud location. Um, okay. I store my images. I have them on two, at least two different hard drives or three, you know, two different hard drives. And I keep them at two, uh, at least one off site. And I rotate them around. I keep one hard drive at our place at the Jersey Shore and keep one here. And then I rotate them around just in case there's a problem. And then keep try to keep multiple levels of backups um, in case 
somehow you get infected. Don't keep a hard drive permanently connected to your computer to a backup. So like do a backup, then disconnect the hard drive. Is if you get infected by ransomware or malware, it's a good chance that it will go after the files on your external hard drive and try to encrypt them. Oh. <laughs> so it, even though you're backing them up to a connected hard drive to your computer, if it's turned on and you get infected by really ransomware or malware, it will find the files and encrypt them. Thank you. So that's, it's very important to back up, disconnect, put it in a safe place. 